Uh, hello, I'm Phil McCaffrey, and this is 8.30 Prep. Tonight, we have a special guest with us, uh, and that is uh, the teen librarian over here. You can see that. Wait, the, over there, over there. I'm looking at the camera. Uh, Emily Fear. Emily and I do a lot of work together with teens. Uh, she's the teen librarian at Swickley Library. How long you been there, Emily? Oh man, um, it'll be let's see, eight years in September. Is it really been eight years? Wow, it, it does. I was gonna, I was gonna say six. It felt like it felt like six years. Eight years in September. So Emily and I do things like uh, practice tests. Uh, we give resources to students. Um, we also do sometimes a crash course uh, or some lectures. And so as I was talking with some students about reading, I thought I would, I, I've always wanted to do this with you, Emily. I've always wanted to have a little seminar about reading because one of the things is I, I teach standardized test reading and I say to students there's, there's no way uh, to improve your reading that's any better than reading. So what I've never done with you is sit down and uh, <laughs> like an elevator. I'm sorry, I'm reading the chat that's going on on, on there. Um, I should have it up. <laughs> you, should, you should, yeah, you should have it up. I should, I should, uh, he's the live chat on my, uh, on my, uh, phone yeah, there you go all right I, I watch it on my phone as well but I've always wanted to talk to you about what what resources were available for reading and we're always scrambling and running around and so I look forward to Swickley being open again and coming down and sitting with you and uh, and getting a list but so then I thought well I could have you on 830 prep so um, yeah. one one of the things about reading is yeah, sorry you got me distracted, Damien. That's okay. I like reading the the uh, the comments. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was um, what what students can read and what they should read. And one of the statements that people always make is, you know, just read anything. You know, would you agree with that statement? Would you agree with just read anything? It depends on the outcome you're looking for. So if the outcome is to keep your brain just in its basic like maintenance role to keep your, your like, to, okay, if you want to keep the status quo operating system just at status quo, then reading anything, just literally anything is going to do that. It keeps your mind going. It keeps your brain working. It keeps it churning at a specific level. Now, if you want an outcome that is aim towards another goal, maybe a, light, a slightly loftier goal, like building your vocabulary for a standardized test, like a lot of your students, or, you know, even just like trying to increase your vocabulary for day-to-day -day usage, or maybe you need ideas for, you just want to generally like build your creative ideas for essay writing and other projects you're doing. Then the whole thing of read whatever doesn't necessarily apply, but yeah, in general, I do agree because I think someone who's reading is be is better than is reading anything is better than someone who's not reading anything. Um, but there's a lot of different types of reading, and I tend to think of it as like you've got like in the same way that we balance a, a nutritious meal, um, reading can be done in the same way. Oh, and I love that! that. Mean, I love that. That's great. That's fantastic. Yeah, and that doesn't mean that your like entree is just like the driest, boniest you know, highest literature, there's lots of really good stuff out there that is going to build your vocabulary, is going to, to give you higher concept thinking topics without boring the ever-loving S out of you. So just because <laughs> it's going to do good things for you doesn't mean that it's, it's like, you know, just like not all healthy meals taste terrible, not all like, you know, good beefy books are going to bore the brains out of you. So it's so it's like potato chips. You know, you don't you don't want to always be eating potato chips for dinner. But um, so reading anything uh, does keep does keep carbohydrates and 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 the basic proteins coming into into your body. But you want to uh, have a balanced meal. I really like that one. That's that's really good. Um, yeah, I mean, on the, on the most basic end, reading is like reading on a day to day basis. Whatever you're reading is like 
basic exercise. But if you want to go further into it than that, then you take the nutrition model because you're getting something different out of different things that you read. And different thing, different types of mediums that you read are going to give you different things. So <laughs> if you're someone who gravitates to graphic novels like I do, that's totally great. There's lots of amazing graphic novels out there. That visual medium tied with the literature medium, that's going to give you something different than, say, digging into like a really dense, like, 800-page Charles Dickens. It yeah. Will. Not that they're better or worse, but it's just different. The last graphic novel I read was actually when you were running the book club that we used to belong to. So I, I'm, I'm not a graphic novel person, but I did read a graphic novel because you suggested it, and I, re I remembered enjoying it very much. And it's something that I could get back into. Uh, yeah. One of my problems is I, I, I read for work. So a lot of times when I go home, I, my, my eyes are very tired. So I'm, I'm reading some of the same passages. But I, I try to keep a book on my nightstand. I'm trying to get through two nonfiction books right now. And I haven't, I haven't gotten through them uh, in the quarantine. And I, and I should. And I've just, I've just been lazy. I don't, I don't know what it is about the quarantine. So this was, this was to spur me on um, to get books. One of the things I wanted to uh, ask you about was uh, where, where to get books when you can't get out to a store. Um, and so what are some of the resources that students can use? Um, okay. did, did, you, did you have the, the presentation you wanted to show? Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah, I mean, I, I've broken down a couple of options for, for students. Let me do some screen sharing. Hold on. Wait a second. Oh, there we go. It's a little green button on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I struck my screen so it wasn't coming up. Okay. There we go. Okay. So now you should be able to see my screen. There you go. Excellent. If I go into this mode, it ruins everything. Oh, nope, doesn't. Okay, cool. Looks perfect. So, um... The short answer is that if you can't get books in person, if you can't go to like the Barnes and Noble or you can't go down to Penguin Bookshop if you live in the Swickley area, or you can't go to your local library or your school library, um, then the short answer is go online. And if you live in Allegheny County or even Beaver County or no matter where you live, pretty much the library, public library system is going to have access to some form or another of electronic books of ebooks. And these are available to you via like Kindle, via um, PDFs oftentimes, or via through like the Overdrive app. Um, Allegheny County has a ton of resources for you. The biggest of which is the is Overdrive. Overdrive is the largest provider of eBooks and eAudio to um, the the national public library systems. So, no matter where you are, likely that library system is using Overdrive. Um, this system used to be, I would say, even that as recently as 10 years ago, used to be like the catalog was kind of limited. Um, if you were looking for adult stuff, that was probably fine. But if you were looking for teen books or children's books, your options would be fairly limited. 10 years later, they, it's awesome. Honestly, like you can get almost anything. Um, if the book is brand, brand, brand new, you might have to wait a little bit extra time. But otherwise, you can usually get a book on there fairly quickly. Um, but I didn't want to limit it to just that. So I'll talk a little bit more about another resource that the public library system offers, but I wanted to go into a, an option for students that anybody can use, no matter what, no library card needed, nothing, because this these are books that belong to the public domain, meaning that they um, have no like licensed copyright. So um, say you go into Barnes & Noble and you see a display of all these like classic books that are like put out by Barnes & Noble's um, these books are oftentimes public domain because anybody can make a, a, a produce a copy of it, basically. So that's why you see like 17 different types of Moby Dick because Moby Dick is in the public domain. So you can you can produce a copy of it if you want to start a printing press and make your own like specialty editions of these various uh, classic books. You can, but if you just want to read them and you can't get a physical copy of them. You can go on to a site called Project Gutenberg and download PDFs of them right to your computers, right to your reading devices, to your phone. I like to read um, because I recently had a had a baby in January. I often can't read a physical book right now because I'm holding a person. <laughs> holding so, a little child. Holding tiger. Holding 
So on my phone, I have a Kindle app. I have a couple other reading apps. I can literally read while I'm doing anything else with the other arm. It's great. And um, I know a lot of students are limited as far as screen time or they've been told that screen time is is somehow bad, et cetera. And th there's a whole debate we can talk about with that. But when it comes to reading books on a screen, although your brain is processing them a little differently and you, you are intaking a little differently because it's your eyes are on a screen and not on a page, the content that you are absorbing is the same. So you're still getting, if you're, if you're reading a big nutritional book, you're still getting a big nutritional meal. You're just processing it mentally a little differently. Yeah, Gutenberg, Gutenberg is uh, a really good uh, site. Um, I use a Kindle, and I, when I first when I first got it, um, I used to I, I downloaded a lot of classics, and I was I was surprised at at how much I liked them. Um, one of the one of the one of the books that that really shocked me of of how how much I liked it was Call of the Wild. You know, I just downloaded it off of Gutenberg, so um, and then read it on my phone. And of course, I'm 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 a I'm a huge fan of Pride and Prejudice, and uh, and I keep I keep that one up. Um, and then I I, per, I mostly read nonfiction, so I'm I'm not a I'm not a big fiction reader. Uh, but the, there was, um, I first got a nook. That was, that was what I wanted to say. I first got a nook, the Barnes and Noble edition uh, yeah. of a Kindle. And so, um, then I went with a Kindle, uh, because my wife complained, I, I had, my screen was too bright. So I got a, a Kindle paper, uh, a paperweight that, that had less, less screen. Cause I stay up a little bit later than the average person. Cause I have to be wide awake at nine o'clock at night. So I try to stay awake. So, but project Gutenberg free, the website is gutenberg.org. Mm -hmm. Yep. Gutenberg with one T B E R G. And who was Gutenberg? Gutenberg was the invent. Oh man, you're asking a mom a <laughs> trivia question. Uh, Gutenberg was the inventor of the printing press, correct? The inventor of the printing press of movable, movable type. Yeah. I would be so embarrassed if I got that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to put you on the spot like that. No, no, it's okay. I should know that. I do know that. I just, I, I you ask me what day of the week it is anymore. There's a 50% chance that I'll tell you the wrong day. I wonder how many the uh, titles there are on uh, Project Gutenberg. Thousands, thousands upon thousands. And the cool thing, and I'll talk about this um, kind of in a little bit, but Project Gutenberg isn't your only option. So like you can get a ton of stuff on Project Gutenberg, but there's other sites you can access that give you even other things that aren't on Gutenberg. And some of that stuff is nonfiction specific. So it might be of interest to you, Phil. Um, but so yeah, so Gutenberg, probably is the most expansive collection, but it's not the only one to look at. What else do you have so, to yeah. look at? Oh, sorry? I said, so what else do you have to look for? Okay, well, so I thought I would just share, so Project Gutenberg specializes in books that are in the public domain. Obviously there's a ton of stuff on there and going into that collection can be really daunting. Um, combined with the fact that its website is still not like it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's not user friendly, but it's not super modern looking. So when you're searching on there, it's like looking at a very inflated, like wiki, like a wiki site, um, very officially produced, but its searches are kind of pedestrian in that way. So I thought I would recommend to anyone who was interested in perusing those uh, 10 books that would help them build their vocabulary or nice. just simply to entertain them. So I've been calling it 10 books in Project Gutenberg to build your vocabulary <laughs> and that you'll like actually want to read because there's a lot of classic books that you might not be so interested in. And I can say that these 10 books that I've picked off of Gutenberg are entertaining or fortifying in some way or another, and not just, not just educational, but also good reads. So a lot of, um, if you are a student and you're like Google searching, like books that will build my vocabulary, important books for me to read, chances are, they're gonna tell you to read Ulysses by James Joyce. Let me tell you that you should not read Ulysses by James <laughs> Joyce I'm, just because I'm, a website told you to. You should read it if you think it sounds interesting and you have a ton of time on your hand and you're an avid reader and you have already delved into James Joyce in one way or another. I've tried I a couple myself, I've tried a couple of times. I haven't made it through it. 
It took me uh, an entire summer. It was the summer of Ulysses. Um, I do not recommend re making it your first James Joyce. I had read a couple of his other books before I read Ulysses, so I was prepared. Um, but yeah, so telling a high school student or anyone, hey, sure, just go ahead, crack into Ulysses is a stupid thing to tell someone. I prefer to recommend Dubliners by James Joyce because it's a collection of stories. They're interconnected in some ways and they all take place in the city of Dublin. Um, they are they are, they are well written and verbose in James Joyce's signature style, but they will not take you an entire summer to read this book. And if you ended up only reading a few of the stories that are within it, that's okay too. So that's a really good place to start. Excellent. If you haven't read Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, you can also read that. We had to read it in school. Um, I don't know if they teach that anymore, but uh, you could also read that book. It's a it's a pretty digestible book considering, but I'd say if you've never read James Joyce and you're curious, start with Dubliners. Excellent. Good. I'll, 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 I'm looking forward to this. You're going to have to email me this afterwards. Yeah. So this one is wild. Um, Charlotte Perkins Gilman is usually known as the author of the Yellow Wallpaper. That's pretty much the only like full, like writing of hers that every a lot of people are familiar with. But if you go on Project Gutenberg, you can find this kind of lost sci-fi utopian like classic about an all-female society that is discovered by these three like academic males who basically like end up taking refuge there and living there and the outcomes of that. Oh, cool. Um, it's what's that? I said that's really cool. Yeah, it's really cool, and it's um, like it's just very ahead of its time. Herland is the first of a trilogy, so if you end up enjoying this book, you can read the two other ones that follow. I have not read those, but I have read the first one, and it's like like shockingly um, contemporary feeling for a book that was written um, prior to 1900, I believe. So, uh, especially if you're somebody who, like myself, really enjoys like science fiction and fantasy stories that have like dystopian or utopian themes. Um, I'd highly recommend trying this one. I'm a big Ursula Le Guin fan, so this book really appealed to me because it had kind of precursor to Le Guin ideas of what what a utopian actually is. What like what is a utopian ideal? What is a utopia? Excellent, excellent. I look for I look forward to that one. Oh, the idiot. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, I really like this book, and when I say that, people think I'm insane because who likes Dostoevsky? Um, but I actually really enjoyed Crime and Punishment when I was reading it in high school, so I gravitate to Dostoevsky. And so Crime and Punishment is a book that is also on those lists, like, oh, read Ulysses and read Crime and Punishment. And sure, you can do that. Or you can read The Idiot and follow this, like, ne'er-do-well as he, like, kind of wrecks the lives of a like well-to-do <laughs> family and the daughters within it. It's very highfalutin. Name. There's a lot of like there's a lot of Russian names that you'll have to keep track of, but it's basically about a guy who like keeps messing stuff up. We would call him in the uh, modern modern vernacular a fail son. A fail son. A fail son. Yeah, my wife just finished Crime and Punishment because her <sighs> my stepson wrote his uh, senior thesis on it. Oh man! Um, it, true story. In senior year of high school, my myself and my still like one of my closest friends, Adam, we were in AP English two, and we read Crime and Punishment, and we had to um, like del like present on a theme in Crime and Punishment in a in a particular way. So some some group did a game show, some group did something else. We did a puppet show, so we did Crime and Punishment. The puppet show. Um, <laughs> to this day, it's like one of my favorite, like one of the best class presentations I ever did. Still think of it often. Um, so Shakespeare comes up a lot when people talk about like worthwhile classics to read, and and rightfully so, so. I have a theater background in addition to my literature background, so Shakespeare is the is the is the tops. I'm not going to swear. Um, but uh, what? As a play that I read of his when I took a seminar, an all Shakespeare seminar in college, I had never heard of and often gets overlooked, which is The Winner's Tale. It's one of his last works, and oftentimes his later works are kind of dismissed or they're thought of as lesser, but I think this one is beautiful. And it's not exhaustive. So if you didn't, you know, if you find things like the multiple history plays pretty tiresome to read, 
this is going to be a lot different for you. It's a very like condensed story. Basically this King thinks that his wife is cheated on him. Um, and that, that belief and that, that wrong belief leads to a chain of events, um, that dovetail in a, in a really surprising fashion. This is a, this is a rare Shakespeare where it's not a comedy, but it's not quite the tragedy that his other plays are, meaning that the ending ends up being happier than, than not, even though it's not one of his comedies. And mm. the rules with Shakespeare is that if it's a comedy, it has a happy ending, and if it's a tragedy, it has a sad ending. Mm. The Winter's Tale breaks that mold in a, in a really beautiful way. Nice, so, nice. Yeah, there's a really strong central, um, the two female characters, a very central bond between the two of them, and it's the type of relationship that you don't see in Shakespeare all that often between two women. You often see that with between two men or between a male and a female, but you don't often get that with, with two female characters like you do in The Winner's Tale. I think that's really cool. Oh, that is cool. Thanks for bringing that one up. I appreciate yeah. that one. This is good. I'm not, I now have a list of things to read. Fantastic. Well, I hope that's useful. I love Oscar Wilde. Again, my theater background makes me um, absolutely beholden to his multiple works for the theater. But if you want to read a fictional story of his, um, his, his, the, his primary novel was The Picture of Dorian Gray. Um, basically, a sell your soul for eternal beauty story, um, but told with his signature wit and, um, and with a slight bit of satire. Um, it's Honestly, its themes are as relevant today, if not more so than, than then. And it's always an interesting question to ask yourself of like, what would you do? What price would you pay um, to, to achieve like, you know, immortal beauty and youth? And as I get older, it only becomes a more interesting question to ask. <laughs> well, I'm, pa I'm, pa I'm past that point, so <laughs> I'd have to get it back. Um, I think I was- Well, if your I, students are watching, they're probably not asking themselves that yet. Yeah, right. You'll live forever, right? <laughs> they, they will live forever. I think I think I read this in high school. I'm trying to remember. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a really digestible story. Oscar Wilde writes with a lot of wit, even when he's not writing dialogue. So it's one of those books that you can honestly, once you get it into, you can probably read in like a day or two. It's really is a really quick read. It is a quick read. All right, um, this one is a little hard to define, but um, the life and opinions of Tristram Shandy, gentleman by Lauren Stern, is a basically a biography memoir or not a biography a memoir from a fictional character who is really bad at explaining things so he takes you through the series of misadventures in his life but he does it in a way that makes little to no sense has very few coherent threads and often ends um in with a lot of shenanigans and nonsense um it's a lot of fun to read especially if you read it in, in parts there's um it's very episodic so you don't have to read the whole thing all at once um but it's a lot of fun especially for a book as old as this and it's probably um it's definitely one of the first of its type of this type of like satirical like um faux biography interesting when was it published do you know oh i don't have the year in front of me um i was actually just reading something about it before we connected but it, it's it's pretty old it's it's like 1800s I, I hear some clicking over there you are you googling Taya's can, you googling. Give me a, can someone give me a year <laughs> yeah Taya, my my stepson producer the cameraman all right i should have looked this up before First i should have put the years on these two 1759 1759 yeah over the next seven years nice nice okay this is one i hadn't heard of yeah, no, it's cool. It's it's a really weird book. Um, and again, first of its type, like you'll read kind of postmodern books that, that take on the type of flavor and type of tone, but those books were, were written in the, the 20th century. Um, this was this was definitely ahead of its time and people have been copying it ever since. Um, I love a good old fashioned ghost story. Um, and Henry James has written a wrote a classic one in the turn of the screw. Um, Basically, a governess comes into a haunted estate to watch two children, and there may be, like, the, the ghosts of two servants who may or may not have died in that household, and you learn a lot about, like, very slowly, a slow burn, you learn about what may have happened to them and why their spirits may linger. It's a really cool, very tense, very suspenseful story. Um, it is very atmospheric, so you, it, you get like very submerged in the details and in the world building. Um, 
if you need a lot of action right away, it's not that type of story, but it is, it will hook you. It will, especially if you like a good ghost story. I can't say I've, ri- I've ever written, uh, written, I've, ri- ri- I've ever read a ghost story. I can't, I can't. You read a ghost story? Like ever? I, and I can't say that I have. What's a good, so this is, this will be one to read. No. This would be, I mean, this is a good one to try. I don't like ghosts. I, I actually, I'm, I'm not scared by them. It's like I don't like horror movies either because I, I find them to be very boring. Oh, see, I mean, I, I love horror movies. And <laughs> Do I, you? I, and I think, I, I think a lot of people will tell you like they love horror movies, but they're not like scared by them anymore. But the funny thing with me is like everything scares me, and I still love horror movies because I just like <laughs> kind of dig being unnerved by things. Um, ghosts in particular are not my like I'm not particularly afraid of ghosts Um, although ever since I had a kid like feeling like he's seeing something that I'm not has gotten me kind of like creeped out and questioning that Um, but still I think it's a fun world to it's a fun idea to toy with and a lot of writers and you know creatives have had interesting ways of discussing that and I think a lot of ghost stories end up opening um concepts and themes that are more about like the price and the the value of living so even if you don't like find them scary or believable in that way a horror especially really good horror can ask us a lot of deep questions just in a in a different framework so like like read frankenstein read mary shelley's frankenstein right i was going to bring that one up frankenstein frankenstein frankenstein's excellent yeah yeah it's a horror story dracula horror story so, like, you know, just because it's it's written in a specific way or a specific genre doesn't mean that you can't get um, themes out of it that will very, very much, like, relate to you in your real life. Well, one I downloaded that from Gutenberg that I really liked was Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Yeah, sure. So that yeah, was, that's Stevenson, right? Um, is that who that the, is? Uh, is that Robert Louis Stevenson? I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure, yeah, yeah. That was that was a, that was a, it was a very quick read. I think I read it in one day. It's a very short book. Yeah, I think they even have like I think that even gets taught in school now too, which I think is cool because it's a it's a genre story. But you know, Stevenson is a, I mean, it's it has that kind of classic status. And I think whenever we get to read books like that for schoolwork, it challenges the notion that these books have no more relevance to us, and they can. I mean, oftentimes we're restricted to reading in school canon stuff that is like all like the dead white male authors right. but that does but that doesn't necessarily mean that we, we can't enjoy some of those books right like we should have a variety there should be a lot of diverse voices that are featured and that is essential um but also like you know you know dracula is awesome or Doc, you know jekyll and mr hyde is awesome like you you can still enjoy these stories um, another book that was definitely ahead of its time was Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Another like travelogue story, um, uh, fantastical in that this doctor um, goes through many fantasy worlds. You are probably familiar with Gulliver's Travels in one way or another because they have made different fictional representations of it from from like live action movies, to animated movies, etc. Um, I'm sure I had seen some kind of animated version of this before I ever knew that it was an actual book. Um, but the book is surprisingly readable, especially for a book that dates as back, I think, is, is also from the 1700s. And, uh, yeah, it's really funny. It's fast-paced. Um, it's it's appealing, it's appealing read aloud. If you are someone who likes that, you can listen to the audiobook. I plan on reading it to my kid because I think it's a good kid book. I think it's a good book for to read aloud to children. Excellent. Okay. So, oh, in college, my first year of college... Um, I had to read Moby Dick and that scared me because I always assumed that Moby Dick was incredibly boring and really dense and hard to get through. Well, it's not, it's awesome. I love Moby Dick. It's one of the, my favorite reading experiences I've ever had. And the pivotal advice I was given when I was struggling early on with it was from my drama instructor, my drama professor at the time in college who told me, okay, if you're having problems with this, Here's what you do. You skip all the chapters that are just about whaling. Because what Herman Melville does is he intersperses this adventure story, this adventure story of madness and revenge, um, with chapters that are very dry and specifically all about the various things about whaling. So 
from the knots that you tie and the ropes that you use to the etymology of whales, etc. Those chapters are what make give this book a bad rap. Now, having said that, after I read the book and loved it and skipped all those chapters, I did eventually years later reread the book and read everything. And I will say that those chapters do add something and it's kind of fascinating as to what they add. They give it this kind of documentary aspect of it while you are in the midst of an adventure story. So it's a neat kind of mental disconnect that Melville is playing with. That being said, if you want to read Moby Dick and you do not want to read 17 pages about various whale types, skip those chapters, it's like every other chapter, and just read the story because the story itself is fantastic. The story itself is just, it's very lean and, and very easy to understand. These, these two guys, they become friends, they get roped into taking this journey with this captain who is trying to hunt this whale that that took his leg. This is, this, the, this is the famous Call Me Ishmael, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great opening. Great, great. Yeah. Oh, it's, and it's a great opening scene too, because he's in this church and there's this sermon from a reverend. It's it's awesome. It gets you roped in right away. And I think the main character's uh, friendship with with the cannibal Queequeg is like a really just great friendship. It goes to a really interesting emotional place. It has a great um, culmination to it. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is a great book. Definitely, Excellent. definitely read it. Just skip the whaling chapters if you have to. <laughs> okay. So this is a, a one I just discovered, and it's actually thanks to a podcast. Um, but I, I like Agatha Christie. I've read a bunch of Agatha Christie, but I'd never read the first Perot mystery. And it's this like very lean book called The Mysterious Affair at Styles. And the way I discovered it was because there is a great um, true crime podcast called Criminal. And the um, host of that um, has spun off during the quarantine times she has spun off a, a free podcast shared with everybody where she is reading a mystery novel chapter by chapter every day so now she's on the hounds of baskerville the arthur conan doyle book but her first one that she did was the mysterious affair at styles and she has a great voice for this she has a great narrative voice um, i highly recommend you people check like check out this book but specifically either through project gutenberg or through the audio podcast uh phoebe reads a mystery um it's a great very like lean mystery a guy goes to a, a country estate and the matron of that estate is poisoned and it's up to his friend the retired detective perot to figure out who did it does he go on um so this is the first perot mystery mm -hmm. uh, uh the other ones earlier in his life is it, I think I think so. I think some are like after he comes out of retirement, and some are like taking place while he was still like a younger man. Okay, cool. Yeah, but, this, this is a really good one, and I had never, I had never even, I don't think I had even heard of it. I guess I didn't remember that there was an order to the Perot books. Oh, I didn't know that either. Um. So, like I said before, Project Gutenberg isn't the only source for free public domain titles. Um, there's a bunch of other resources that um, people can check out. Um, let me just jump to uh, the Hathi Trust Digital Library was done through the New York Public Library, who through kind of like a weird licensing loophole was able to make uh, like thousands of manuscripts and various other documents um, open source and to the public. Um, so in addition to all these other ones, you can check out those. Um, uh, LibriVox uh, does free public domain audiobooks utilizing volunteer narrators. So some are better than others. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but you do you do find some that are uh, some volunteers who have a have a knack for it. Um, Digital Public Library of America is another great one. Um, Daily Lit, Classic Literature Library. These are these are all just other sites that you can consult. Some will have a direct overlap with Project Gutenberg, and some will feature things like the Half I Trust. Some will, will feature things that isn't that aren't on Project Gutenberg that are actually exclusive to that site. Excellent. But they are all free to everybody. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah. So, um, if you are like, I will never read a book that is older than ten years older old unless I absolutely have to. 
then I thought maybe for, um, or if you just are interested in something that's more contemporary, I did make a short little list of books that are available through Hoopla that are contemporary titles. So they're only a couple of years old. Um, Hoopla is similar to Overdrive that I mentioned before. Um, it is available through the library system. Um, so all you need is your library card number and you can download the Hoopla app on your phone or there's, I think there's like a Roku app, there's a couple different apps. The reason you might do this is because in addition to books and audiobooks, you can download um, and watch movies, TV series, music. There's a really nice catalog on Hoopla and I recommend anybody check it out because I've actually, I, I stream things on my, on my phone from it all the time. Their movie catalog is actually surprisingly good. If you are a horror fan, they have a lot of good horror movies. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, so this is on Roku, so I could download this on my Roku. I believe so. Yeah, I think I think they have a Roku app. I think they have apps on every major like cool. Medium. I'll check it out. Um, the reason I recommend these these titles that are available via Hoopla is if you go into Overdrive and you find a book on there that you want to download, if it's already been checked out, if all the copies that are available through Overdrive have been checked out, you got to place a hold. Hoopla is weird in that, or not weird, but it is special in that you don't ever have to wait. So if you go on Hoopla and you find these titles, you'll be able to download them right away. It's, I won't get into the reasons why it's a payment structure thing, but basically if there's a title on Hoopla, you can get it at any point. So the author is <laughs> getting, the author is getting paid. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. I cool. mean, uh, the authors are always getting paid. The I mean, honestly, it's the publishers who get paid. Yeah. The authors are getting <laughs> The publishers get them get this part, and the authors get this part, and it's a big thing. But the way the payment structures work for Hoopla, it means that titles are available on demand. Excellent. It, yeah. These are also all Alex Award winners. Um, Alex Award is through the American Library Association and the its offshoot, the Young Adult Library Association, YALSA. Um, Alex Awards are given every year to 10 books, 10 or so books that um, are published for adults, but have youth appeal. So either the main character is young or like it, it's a family story, so there are young characters involved or it's a coming of age situation, or simply that they believe that there is some kind of appeal towards towards the younger audience. So their vocabulary is a little higher oftentimes, um, but the, the main characters are relatable and the circumstances are relatable sometimes. Sometimes they're still pretty fantastical like Down Among the Sticks and Bones, which is one of a interconnected series. You do not have to read all of the books to, to read one of them. So this is actually the second book in this, um, Home for Wayward Children. Um, it re-envisions the story of Jack and Jill. You know, Jack and Jill, one of the hill. It re-envisions the story of Jack and Jill as these sisters who um, went through a very various series of traumatic experiences before winding up in this home for like troubled fantastical children it's a really neat really dark story um and if you read this i highly recommend going through the rest of the series because they these characters pop up again but it's a great way to, to you know enhance your vocabulary while also like stoking your imagination in a very like vibrant way Lawn Boy by Jonathan Evison is a um, ex like extremely like relatable, um, relevant title to right now. A young Mexican American um, is attempting to try and make his future brighter, um, but social and class distinctions and cultural discrimination keep getting in the way. Um, really highly recommend this title. It sounds really heavy, and in, there are heavy themes to it, but it's very, very readable. Excellent. So this is a weird one, but I thought it was a, a great one to include because we are particularly talking about vocabulary building, and this book is all about vocabulary, um, specifically lexicon. Um, Max Ferry is a like a speculative science, science fiction writer, and in lexicon there is a secret cabal of um, agents who use words as weapons. And they have figured out how to weaponize specific words and word usages um, and like and word couplings. They find a like prodigy in this who, while she is training, um, falls in love. And because of that, uh, everything falls apart and she goes on the run and someone is an innocent is roped into this. And it, there's, it goes back and forth between the before and the after. 
It's a really interestingly structured book, and it's all about the power of words. Oh, that sounds really good. I, I, it's really. I, I'm yeah. going to try this one. It's really, really good. I, I enjoy this one tremendously. Um, and it kind of hit me out of nowhere because uh, I forget what his first book was. I think it was Jennifer Government, and I liked that one okay. But this one is just really inventive. Things we have in common is a combination coming of age story and um, possible like murder mystery. Um, it's unclear. <laughs> I will not say if it is actually a murder mystery, but it's a uh, what happened type suspense story uh, coupled with just a misfit trying to fit in and believing that her ticket to fitting in is befriending a popular girl um, who doesn't have won't won't give her the time of day. Um, it's it's really uh, again just very readable. Um, kind of pulpy in premise, but the writing is, is very, very good. Uh oh, then Alice disappears. Uh oh. Yes. Yeah, and I won't say anything else because, you know, the whole disappearance is the point of it. Is, okay, cool. Um, Mr. Penumbra's 24 Hour Bookstore by Robin Sloan, again, is about the power of words and language in books. Um, a young man um, during the recession in the late 2000s finds himself out of work. He takes a job at a strange 24-hour um, bookstore that doesn't seem to have much in the way of traffic during the daytime, but at night uh, attracts a very particular clientele. Um, it's a neat book. Um, it's very like weirdly warm and comforting, despite it having kind of like an interesting and kind of arcane premise. Um, it's all. A, it ends up with a like a vast community trying to figure out a mystery slash even like save this bookstore from going away. Um, I highly recommend it. It surprised me and it's, it's a very quick read too. It's very character based. So don't be put off by it's kind of by it's weird premise or it's, it's odd premise. It's very much about this young man just kind of trying to figure out the direction in his life is taking him when it takes him into a really odd direction. <laughs> Great. And then this book is devastating and will rip your heart out. So don't read it if you're already feeling sad <laughs> or if you want to lean into those feelings. <laughs> I love this book. Don't, but wait, I wait the, 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 the title of this was What to Read During Quarantine, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, maybe you want to, maybe you need some catharsis. Maybe you want to um, feel sad during quarantine. I love it this book but i wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole right now i'm too emotionally fragile for that but it's it's devastatingly good um louise erdich is a um writer who specializes in telling the stories of native americans especially native americans now um so she has books that take place with in like more uh, historical context but she does tell a lot of more contemporary stories of what like indigenous people of america how they live like what tribal life and reservation life is like now um, and this is about a young man whose mother is a uh, tribal enrollment specialist. They live in a, on a reservation in North Dakota. And she, after being brutally attacked, just um, just sinks into a deep depression, cuts herself off from the family, changes entirely. And um, he and his friends try and track down the person responsible for this. And it takes a lot of surprising routes. And it is as it is as heavy as it sounds. So again, maybe if unless you need the cathartic <laughs> release uh hold off on this one for now okay i don't i don't i don't need really anything to make me more depressed <laughs> it is really good and it's especially a good book um i know that there's a lot of young men out there who maybe shy away from books that are written by female authors because we just have this weird like knee-jerk reaction to believe that you know male men don't read women but that's not true um, everybody reads everything when it's a good book, um, but the central characters are all young men, and I found that um, I found them to be some of the most relatable characters I've ever read on the page, despite our circumstances being very, very different. I mean, these are all young men who live on the reservation and have very different backgrounds to me, and I'm just a young white lady. What do I know about that life? But I did find their their friendship and their different interactions and their relationships and the bonds that they had super relatable. So I highly recommend this book even if you don't want to read it right now. Um, and Phil, you asked me to share a couple articles. Yes. Just for quick reading. And I thought that was a great idea because maybe you don't want to read a whole book. Maybe you don't read books. Maybe you don't read books. I talk to my teens all the time about this. I run a summer reading program at the library. And we don't, for teen summer reading, we don't require books. 
like you can read books, but you can also read magazines. You can read newspapers. You can read online articles. You can read all kinds of stuff because if you really think about the reading you're doing, a lot of my students are reading all the time. They're just not reading, you know, chapter paper books, and this makes them think they're not readers, but they are. They're they're digesting a ton of stuff. Is it always the most nutritional, the nutritious meal of reading? Not always, but they are continually reading. So if we go back to that like baseline of are you reading every day, reading whatever you want? Yes, they are. And they can get like, we can work from that baseline. If you're not reading at all, we can't, that, that's a very hard place to start from. But if you're reading something every day, we can work with that. So if you have 15 minutes, you might just want to delve into some articles. And I found some ones that don't require a subscription. So no paywalls necessary. Um, a couple just really like general good sources I really love. I love public source. I think that they do great reporting. They do a lot of like firsthand accounts. They do a lot of um, multi-series accounts. So they'll take like a theme and they, they do articles based on that theme, um, featuring interviews with people um, in various walks of life. I really enjoy their series about what it's like to be a minimum wage worker in today's economy and today's life. Um, Melissa Guerra Grant did a really interesting article recently for New Republic about the criminal history of mask wearing in New York City. Um, and how that is committed. So there's been a long on the books law against wearing masks in public, and that has butted up against the recent mandate to wear masks in public due to the spread of COVID-19. So um, she delves into the interesting history of this of this weird law and why it exists, and how it um, how it butts up against um, issues of vulnerable populations who are already who already prone to suffer from economic and police injustice. It's a it's a really interesting um, take on what it means to wear a mask, like what it means to go out in public with your face partially obscured and how that is different for people of some walks of life compared to others. Wow, that's good. I think I'm going to read that one. Yeah, and it's it's real brief. It's it's pretty short. It's pretty it's it's pretty brief. Some of these like the low age living uh, report is a couple of different articles and um, there's um, Blood Will Tell, Investigating in Forensic Science is a couple different articles. So they're like a series of articles. But this uh, New Republic article is just one off. So um, Blood Will Tell, I just, I'm a true crime person. Um, I run a true crime group in addition to my duties at the library. And um, I really loved this uh, multiple, this, this multiple reports from ProPublica about investigating bloodstain pattern analysis, which has long been used to convict people for crimes, but they've recently um, begin, begun to question the findings of these, this analysis and whether it's actually a credible way to convict somebody for a murder. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, there's a couple different articles in this series. There's one that is based specifically around a woman who was convicted for a crime um, based on this analysis, but it came out years later that this was, that she was likely not responsible. Um, so there's just a couple different articles in this that are really worth reading. And that's it. That's all I got. That is fantastic. So go back, there we go. You know, um, we went we went a little bit longer than I normally go, but I I was I was thrilled. I I've got to tell you the truth. Um, uh, you are as good as I thought you were. I thought this would be fantastic, and you you are the librarian rock star uh, of uh, you know of the Teen Queen. I mean, I always say uh, you know that the, the teenagers have uh, are really blessed to have you in their life, and 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 I have to tell you personally, for the last eight years, it's just been a fantastic experience to know you and and know so much, and I can't believe it's taken me this long to get a reading list from you. I feel I feel like I've wasted eight years because all we've ever talked about was was me helping you with teens on standardized tests instead of me sitting down saying give me something good and that's one of the things that I quite frankly missed was uh, the book club that you gave because there's no way I would have ever read the books that I, I read to join your your book club and I still remember the night circus um, yeah. which, which was the first one I, I read and, and joined you in our in our get lit uh, uh, book club so I'll s definitely look uh, into some of these articles and books um, you you are quite a blessing uh, if somebody wants to get in touch with you how do they 
how do they reach out to you? Um, so I'm the head of the teen department at Stokely Public Library. So you can find me um, via the library. Um, my email is the easiest way to get in touch with me. It's my last name, fear, like the emotion, F-E-A-R-E at E-I network.net. <laughs> Um, or you just go on the library website, and my information is listed there. You're li- you're on so Swick- So if they just googled Swickley Public Library, mm-hmm. Teen Library, and they can find you. And Emily yeah. Emily is is always available. I have to, to tell. Uh, I hope I hope I get a lot of views on this. Emily is always available to me. I I I I'm I'm always amazed at how much you get done uh, and, and how quickly you respond. So thank you so much for being uh, on 8:30 Prep. It was it was uh, yeah. it was really really enjoyable, and I and I've and I got a lot out of it. So I'm um, I'm quite pleased. Um, oh my gosh! Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, um, have a good night. I hope your son stays asleep all night and you get a nice, restful uh, night's sleep. I, I, I know that uh, having a baby is, <laughs> is uh, well, you just don't get any sleep. So, But it was, it was great talking to you. Thanks for Thanks joining. So. Uh, we'll, see you. we'll see you, Emily. Thanks for joining us at 8.30 Prep. Tomorrow I'll be doing a, um, a lesson on how to read specifically to get the answer on the ACT and the SAT. So this will be a really big, uh, 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 a real quick lesson uh, for me as compared to this one. But do some reading in quarantine. The best way to improve your skill at reading is to read. Would you agree? 100%. All right. Thanks so much for being on. I'm Phil McCaffrey. Have a good night.